Hello. Today on AP Taylor Swift, we have an episode on poetic repetition. Things like epizuxis. What is epizuxis? I have no idea. We're going to learn together. But before we get into that, a couple of class announcements. As always, we make a lot of suggestions for books and reading, additional material. You can check those all out in our show notes. We often link books and whatnot to our bookshop, bookshop.org slash shop slash APTS. And also we have a Substack where we do lots of extra credit background on the topics. You can sign up at aptaylorswift.substack.com slash subscribe. I have a feeling this one's going to have a lot of extra credit in the Substack and in the show notes because we might have to, or maybe I'm just the one that needs all of the background information uh, for this topic. So Jen, why don't you kick us off by giving us a little uh, primer on poetic repetition? Yes. I'm just going to be fully honest to you, dear listeners, and let you know we did make a pivot about five minutes before (laughs) we started recording. So we are all really on this journey together. So we were originally going to do a specific type of poetic repetition and then realize the songs we chose had some multiple things going on. So we expanded it so we can explore the full poetic beauty of these songs but it's me hi i'm the problem <laughs> it's me you know you say that but i don't know that i fully understand epizuxis anyway and so i might have just like i mislabeled metaphors and similes in our previous episode like i'm definitely gonna mislabel things so i'm kind of glad we've expanded it so i can learn about different types and make all of the mistakes together yeah i i, I think this will make a better episode so you are not the problem i, I think you, you are the solution you i think you made this better <laughs> so there's going to be different versions of this that honestly the best to under understand through examples which the songs we have are examples so we'll dive into that but at the highest level repetition tends to just be a focal point of emphasis. Um, So if you think about one of the kinds we'll do is called anaphora, and um, it's when it's a repeated word at the beginning of multiple phrases. Um, And a really good example of that is the opening to A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief so on and so forth. And so you can see how repetition in all the examples we'll go over, it kind of catches your ear. It kind of helps you think, oh, I should focus on this because you're getting it over and over again. It doesn't think need about to be like the been... exact same thing because in that example, it's not this, it's not repeating the exact same set of words. It's the parallelisms of yeah, the, so anaphora it was, it was. is yeah anaphora is the same phrase same word a couple words at the beginning of different phrases so at the beginning, it, was, okay. example, it was it was it, it was, was it was it was, it was okay. is the anaphora I gotta write this down. another one we're going to talk about is epizuxis uh which is a fun word and i will spell it for you because why not epizuxis is e-p-i-z-e-u-x-i-s i'm an epizuxis that is repeating the same word or short phrase in rapid repetition so you get this a lot particularly it's really common in shakespeare plays which i think it's common probably in a lot of plays um but these are just well known so Uh, there's a moment in King Lear where the king is fainting with grief and he just says never and never. He just repeats that word over and over again. Um, and you also get in other things like Walden, um, Pharaoh starts off a passage with simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Macbeth, Um, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, which I actually know from Hamilton, which is just quoting Macbeth. But it's kind of like, you know, when you're in class and a uh, like a teacher or professor repeat something a couple of times it kind of triggers your brain to be like oh i should remember this it might be on an exam this is like the poetic version of that where it signals to you the listener of something's happening here that i should you know either it's really important like in the walden simplicity 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 that's like the core of walden is that phrase or in other things like the, some of the ones we're going to talk about it has different effects but it tells you the listener or reader or whatever of I should pay attention to this because it's important I think at the core and two quick notes anaphora actually does have multiple meanings and we're we're using the rhetorical meaning I think it has like a slightly different definition grammatically speaking so we're obviously talking about the rhetorical device uh, which is the repetition at the beginning of each phrase and then I just found uh somewhere that there's also a different word for epizuxis too it's like yes pelagola I said that perfectly. Pal- no, I'm sorry, no. what? Pelagogia? Yes, I, Pelagogia. I, I... That's right. <laughs> 
Um, so I knew there was a pal and a G in the second half, so I just went for it. Yeah, yeah, palagogia. So I think if you if you are familiar with that word, it's the same thing. I think palagogia is a Greek origin name for the same thing. Yeah, and Epizuxus is in Greek. Latin. What is that? It's Latin. Latin. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I never took Latin. I was oh, well. um, student of the year for Latin, my senior year of high school. That doesn't surprise me at all. I was not popular, but it's okay. I, I took French. But here you are now, and look at how far that Latin <laughs> student of the year award has taken you. I know. I took French and Latin because um, that was cool. I know. Look at me. Um. Okay. Any other notes on high level repetition? I have the first song. So just that I'm going to get it wrong and I'm going to ask a lot of questions. So thank you for being patient. I, this will be fun. We talk about her, her stuff as poetry often, and it's going to be fun. I think one thing we should keep in mind as we have this conversation, as we often do with metaphors of she could have chosen any image for the metaphor. So why did she choose this one? I think we can do the same thing with the repetition of she can communicate her message many ways. Why is repetition the choice she made here? I think that's a good question for us to be thinking as well in this conversation. Okay. Jen, All right. kick us off. So I did... We are never, ever getting back together. Or is it just we are never getting back together? No, it says whatever. we are never, ever. Okay. There's only one it was, written, <laughs> it was written by Taylor Swift, Max Martin, and Shellback. It came out in 2012 on Red and again in 2021 on Red Taylor's version. And it's track eight. But I think we can argue since it was the big single from Red, it may be track eight. But I think it's probably the first song a lot of people uh, would uh, associate recognize. with this particular album. Yes. So very straightforward. Epizuxis, we are never, ever, ever getting back together. So we're repeating that ever. Multiple so is it times. ever the epizuxis or is it we are never yeah. ever? Um, so you can do two things. You could say really ever ever is the epizuxis. So it's the okay. quick words. And the thing too with epizuxis is it's usually like almost an exclamation. It's it's often used. It's emphatic. Yes, for intensity. And so that's really where you get that here of like, it's not just we're never getting back together. We are never yeah. ever, ever, ever ever getting back ever. together. Like ever. Yeah like ever um and then the other one and we can we can talk about both of these but we do have some anaphora too which is the next mm. line of you go talk to your friends talk to my friends talk to me so that's the anaphora of the talk to talk to talk to so those are the two big things of repetition here we did it episode over next one done <laughs> uh, so one thing that i think is again that question of why does she do it this way because she could have just said we were never getting back together why the emphasis of it and i think i mean it seems obvious, but that's what's kind of fun, I think, about like dissecting poetry and art like this. Even if it's obvious, it's still, if you start pulling up that thread, it still helps you understand the impact. Because um, this was a huge song. Like, this song made way. It was an earworm. I feel like, yeah, it was an earworm. It felt like sort of the second coming of Taylor Swift in some Ooh, ways. What a good, wow. <laughs> Love it's that. It's still when it comes on at a party, like people throw down like this is one of those things that everybody knows the words partially because it's like the same few words again being repeated I mean that could be one of the reasons uh that's a choice because everyone knows the words and it's really catchy but mm. it's still to this day like it is it comes on and the, the crowd goes wild crowd favorite and why is that yeah, I think the repetition is part of it. And it's something I think we'll kind of continue to talk about. But the songs that she chooses as singles, she definitely doesn't pick, you know. We're going to get like, into this in the deep dive. Yeah, she doesn't pick the, we're like, use the most long form this is not, storytelling yeah. complex. And this song is not emblematic of Red. So you mentioned that this is the song that many people probably think of when they think of Red because it was the first season. But I, I don't. I think of All Too Well. I think of Red. I think of... Well, we also talked about the difference between red branding in her version yes. versus her the original. Episode, and I correct. I do think that in her original version of red, this was very much like yeah. such an she, album song. Um, it was it was kind of she needed to show the transition that she was, I knew you were trouble. Twenty two. Yeah. She started. But, to, she was trying to show that she was trying, starting to make the transition to pop. And I, yeah. I don't know. Is is Epizuxis, Is this like something you see more in pop than you see in country? Maybe. I think you do. I was trying to think of another example of it. And the first one that came to mind was Queen Bicycle. The is they repeat <laughs> bicycle over and over bicycle. again. And then it's also enough. I want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride my bike. So you get that 
and an, also an incredibly catchy, very fun song. Um, mm. But that was, and then you think of like even Justin Bieber, Baby, it's Baby Bo. Yellow baby, Submarine. Baby, baby, oh, yeah, Yellow Submarine. So yeah, you definitely, I think I would I, guess, yes, more than country, but I'm, I'm but trying to remember just labeled country con- memories. Yeah, <laughs> right, guessing, we know but, more pop songs. Well, country songs. music also is very much about storytelling, storytelling. often. Yeah. And therefore, I feel like anaphora would be a stronger device used where you're starting phrases with similar words words to show continuity but maybe evolving it over time we're talking without any evidence to like back this up but I, that to me makes sense yeah. but there is still storytelling like i actually think this song catches on so much because it's still a story that is yeah. very relatable of like you were in a relationship you broke up they came back fine we'll try this again you broke up again try this again and it's like and this is the song that's like enough we're not doing we're breaking the cycle Yeah. So that was, that was two of the things that I was, uh, two things I was thinking is one, it is emphatic. So that's definitely something where this isn't just, we're never getting back together. It is different. If I say we're never getting back together versus we are never, ever, ever getting back together. It's small, but it's different. Like you guys, as my friends, if I said something like that, you would know, like the first one, the second one, you're like, okay what happened like let's talk about this and so it it does it does communicate the intensity and i think it is also so helpful to place it in the time i Mm. think this song in 22 to me seemed very much like sister songs because it's the happy free confused and lonely at the same time the on again off again relationship and i remember Mm -hmm. when this came out that it was like even if you weren't breaking up with someone it still hit that like early 20s need to just scream about never again yeah <laughs> like it kind of didn't matter what it was but like that intensity has its place here but i also think it goes into the the anaphora one you go talk to your friends talk to my friends talk to me what that kind of does is it, it does again create that image we have that storytelling but this song to us feels repetitive but also the on again off again relationship also felt repetitive which i think right. is where we get to this second layer of like Oh, that's actually kind of interesting because you do have moments in the song where you're like, yeah, we've said this before. And it's like, yeah, this song is also talking about we've said this before. We've, we've said done I, this. we break we've, up. I hate you. It, you call me. I love you. That's actually how it opens up. The very first line is uh, this time. Like, I remember after, when yeah. we broke up the first time. Yeah. Yep. It like it starts off that way, setting the stage. The this whole song different. is very colloquial. And I think both Anaphora and Epizuxis help give it that colloquial talking to a friend feeling. I almost said vibe. I'm really trying to not use vibe every other word. <laughs> um, but the whole first verse is relaying this story, right? Like I remember when we broke up the first time, we said, this is it. I had enough. Because like, right, that cause like. And then you have the on the fourth line when you said you needed space and then parentheses what your sorry no because she says like so much in this song i'm gonna say like so much on this episode you have that storytelling that feeling of sitting next to your friends gabbing about oh my god can you believe this guy came back again like what yeah and we talk a lot about how she does so many songs in first person and kind of like generally genderless which means we can apply it anyone can step in which is true but I think this is one of the songs that has so much personality in it, too. And again, it's personality that I really feel like captures the early 20s female the feeling. Experience. Yeah. Um, and we know she's breaking up with a dude because he says, so he calls me up. Yes. And he's like, so we know the person she's talking about is a guy. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where, again, she could have written this song in so many ways. And I feel like she had two goals. I think she wanted to create a pop single that was signaling a change in her direction but she did but i also think she intentionally used the repetition to add the effect to what else was going on in the song the repetition is catchy but it does really capture this we're spinning around again and again and again which like she's used other metaphors like that yeah but it just it just captures that feeling in a very and, and i don't say this in an unkind way in a very immature way um which I also enjoy because you have, I think if you compare this one to All Too Well, everyone's going to say All Too Well is obviously the more well-written song. And I don't deny that. But the moment where I in life have been really mad at someone or something and just been like, screw you, burn this bridge. I don't want an All Too Well. I want to scream, we are never, ever getting back together. Yeah. I think it captures 
the feeling that really well. That particular kind of immature emotion that still has its place in the grieving process or processing of moving on from something. The very like um, surface level emotions, the first emotions that you feel. Yeah. It's like that first line Anger. of defense. Yeah. But I also like the emphasis of the ever, ever, because it's so intense, but it was also something that I feel like we, I can think of other breakup songs, I think, that I listen to. But this, to me, we talk about agency so much on this podcast because it's, one, it's a thread in her songs, but it's a thread in her career and in our lives as well as women. Mm-hmm. But this was one of the first songs where it wasn't that I can distinctly remember. That wasn't like a super sad breakup. This was her drawing the line in the sand and saying, no more. You don't get to do this to me anymore. Like we have like picture to burn where she's like burning stuff. Yeah, it's more destructive. This is but more... this is just a like this is a I'm drawing the line. Um, and I that's the intensity of the ever ever also communicates that like, nope, you can't do this to me anymore. I'm saying you can't do this to me anymore. I'm telling all my friends like I am like this is I am publicly announcing this is not happening anymore. Um, and that in a different way than some of the other songs still right. felt kind of empowering. I think. And you don't even know in this song, like, you don't get a sense of what the relationship was like. You just get a sense of the breakups, the constant breakups. And that tells you enough about whatever was happening that it's not about, like, in my head, I'm thinking, like, should have said no, or someone, you know, cheats and should have said no to something, right? Like, we usually get a hint of what happened in the relationship to cause a breakup. This is just about the constant getting back together and breaking up, getting back together and breaking up. Yeah, I, to me, it's a pretty simple song. It's like, we it was a pop song it was meant to be catchy it was meant to be memorable it was meant to like really be one of those songs that gets stuck in people's head it the key theme here that she always that she starts with and she like repeats in the non repetition parts is uh that called me up again last night um this time it's it's basically this time it's i've had enough um I'm like looking for the specific lyrics. Yeah, this is it. I've had enough. We haven't seen each other in a month. Like she's she's trying to emphasize the fact that this is it. And then the rest of the song is filled in with these repeating parts that we're never mm-hmm. getting back together. And so you kind of like set the stage and then you deliver like this is it for emphasis. Um, and that's kind of it. Like there's not like a ton addition. No, but it says it. so much but it says so much and it's so effective <laughs> at doing yeah. that like when she says never ever 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 like ever like you're like i get it 27 get it. evers i counted 27 <laughs> evers i might have been missed one or two i don't think so 27 yeah, and, this, this is together. not my this is not my favorite taylor swift song by any means but i will fun. say it was one of the shockers at the heiress tour where i was like oh you know whatever and then i was like okay i am yeah, jamming right now but it's super fun and i also think i'm about to sort of repeat what i said earlier but i think it's still worth saying again of one of the things that is so powerful about what she does is she really like i don't know if there's any emotion i've ever had that she has not sung about one time right. or another and human emotions are not all complex sometimes they are as simple as get away from me and never come back and having a simple song to represent that simple very intense emotion is still really valuable yeah. um, i think well, and, and this is where I think it's the combination of the lyrics and the music that like really mm-hmm. it turns it into the the magic because I think when you like just read the lyrics on text as it is, you're like, okay, this yeah. is the same thing over and over again. But right. when you look at it literarily, like you're like, no, this is an actual device that she's choosing to use again and again to drive a point home. You add music to it and it's different every time she sings it and that is adding additional emphasis to the point that by the time you get to the end, like you have really stirred up. She has managed to stir up some really strong emotions. People scream this song and people love it. Um, and, and then that pause that she has, we didn't, we're focused on repetition today. So we're not talking about like the ellipses, but the like ever at the end, she pauses for emphasis too. Like you're adding additional emphasis and people just go wild like at, at that, at that point. So it's definitely really, really effective at what it's doing. It's just very simple. It's a simple route. The only other thing I'll say, because I do think this is really clever, is that I used to think that we were forever, ever. And I used to say, mm-hmm. never say never. So this ever word just has forever, said. too. And the fact that she plays with that and is using that same... Because 
you know, it's it is a poem, yes, but she sings it, so it was written to be vocalized. And there's something really fun about the repetition of the sounds ever, even in different words. Mm. Um, that I think is just kind of cool that she's playing with that. We hear it that forever and never are very close to each other, like phonetically. Um, and it's just a thin line. I think there's like it's one of those things that fun. did she mean it or not? Who knows? Who cares? It's something I definitely get of the I used to say think that we were forever, ever. And I used to say never say never. How similar that sounds, but how the meanings are absolutely the opposites. Um, and it, to me, the song is kind of like this was a relationship that was walking that line. I have the next song, another first single. This is Shake It Off. This is from 1989, which originally came out in 20, 1989. Taylor's version came out in 2023. This is track six, written by Taylor Swift, Max Martin, and Shellback. And I will go on record as saying that this is my favorite Taylor Swift song. And I know that I'm going to get flack for that. And I hope that, you know, I'm not trying to change anybody's mind, but I hope that, you know, similar to what we just did with We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together and showed how this simple song actually is pretty poetic and and has an impact, um, you know, maybe we'll do that for some people here. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm not an expert on poetic devices or rhetoric or any of it. So um, when we said we would do something, it, it's like repetition, poetic repetition, Shake It Off immediately came to my mind because it is my favorite song. So is the Epizuxis the play, 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 play? Yes. yes. I think it would be the rep. So the Epizuxis is, the, is not actually in the Shake It Off. It's the, in the chorus. Mm-hmm. Play, play, player's gonna play, a hater's gonna hate, I'm just gonna shake. And then... Would shake it off, shake it off be an anaphora? No, it's still epizuxis because it's yeah. a phrase. It's still epizuxis. The whole you phrase You kind of get some anaphora in the... She just starts a, uh, a lot of um, the lines with I, even if they're contra- contractions. I think there's mm. still something there. I ne- okay. never miss a beat. I'm lightning on my feet. I'm dancing on my own. I'll make the moves up as I go. She's starting yeah. uh, okay, her so the I first. Okay. So... All right. So I was right that the shake it off is still epizuxis. Yeah. Like, but it is interesting. Shake it off. Yeah. Cause it's a whole phrase. It's not just a word, which I think yeah. still works, but. Well, same yeah, word. I... It can be the same. You said it could be the same word as well. Right. So the play, play, think, play, play. I think it has to be consecutive. It's like, you it's don't want to. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think, I think the play, 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 play is maybe the more purely epizuxis and shake it okay. off is like, maybe it's kind of a couple of different things there play 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 hate 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 100 percent. that's epizuxis got it so i think let's talk about why she uses the repetition and in order to do that i think it's good to talk a little bit more about the song itself and and what the story here means i mean really it's a song about not letting other people's perceptions of you let you down that you are more than what people say or see or what they think about you that's what i see this song as so she's talk starts out the song by talking about all the things that people say about her i say out too late got nothing in my brain that's what people say so we know that that's not who she is that's what people are saying about her she goes on too many dates but they never stay despite all that i keep cruising can't stop won't stop moving it's like i got this music in my mind saying it's gonna be all right so she's got this you know i wrote down don't let the haters stop you from doing your thing. Kevin G from Mean Girls. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this song is to me. Don't let the haters stop you from doing your thing. And so you know what? The players, so here's where we get the the, the importance of that repetition. The players, they're going to play, 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 play. Haters going to hate, 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 hate. I am just going to shake, 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 shake it off. And here, shake it off is just like shake off all that hate, all that negativity, all of everything that everybody else is saying about me, I'm going to shake it off and just be me and be who I am. To me, like this is kind of similar to the last song in that that pre-chorus yes. kind of sets it up. Uh, that sure. I keep cruising, can't stop, won't stop moving. Uh, I think I'm not the best grammatical person, but I think that's present participle where it's like it's something that like keeps happening Continu- like she's trying to show that it's continuous mm. and the epizuxis is almost like a response to that it's like it's not just that they're gonna keep playing like the gonna play by itself would say one thing but in response to that previous 
uh, pre-chorus setup, it's like, it's going to keep happening for God knows how long. They're going to play, play, play. They're going to hate, hate, hate. Right. And it, it's something that never ends. And I think it's very effective, that repetition and driving that point specifically. And I think you also, to that point, the fact that that's ne- that ever ends, it's going to keep going. I didn't, ca- I love that I counted the evers in your song, Jen, and I didn't count the shake it offs in my song. I'll do that at some point. Um, but she says it a lot, right? Like, but before the bridge, it's all just shake it off, shake it off, I, 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 shake it off, right? So you get this sense of how much you have magnitude. to shake. The magnitude yeah. of what you're trying to shake off and how much is coming at you that you just need to kind of get rid of. And then the whole end of the song is just three verses of shake it offs. Like, yeah, it's almost like it's like to the level of hate that you get. You need to match that with like equivalent level I mean, of shaking off. I'm going to go on a Harry Potter reference. It's like when Harry Potter and Voldemort are are dueling and you see the like, I'm sorry, I'm going to the movie and not the book, but basically like the energy pushes back and forth. You have to push back with that equal magnitude. Otherwise, it's going to kill you. And you can't yeah, let that I happen. can give a math example when you need to Please. cancel out the two things on the <laughs> different. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, Harry Potter is literary, <laughs> so you know this is also AP calculus. Please, please don't do that to me. Please, yeah, yeah, I. Oh God, help me. You cancel it on this side of the equal sign. You got to cancel it on that side of the equal sign. I am now even more glad we changed this to poetic repetition because I think we might have a third one here Ooh. that I'm realizing it's. It's borderline. Some some people might argue with me, but I don't care. I'm going to say it anyways. So epistrophe oh my God. is where there's a repetition at the end of the line. So can't stop, won't stop. The stop mm. is being repeated. So it's the opposite. Anaphora is it's at the beginning. Epistrophe is it's at the end. Um, and the example, it's, I mean, this is like sort of literary, but is the uh, Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address is the government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's epistrophe. Mm. So can't stop, won't stop. Taylor okay, Swift I have a and stop. Abraham Lincoln, best friends. I have a can't stop, won't stop story that has nothing to do with Taylor Swift, but the song can't stop, won't stop, Rockefeller Records. It came out in like, they had a rap music video and that rap music video was filmed at my high school. And in that music video, it's like all these half naked women like coming down the stairs and the stairs they're coming down of out of is like right in front of the headmaster's office and it caused a big stir. Um, they also filmed, oh God, Billie Jean, I think at my high school, One, some other michael jackson movie but anyway can't stop won't stop i always think of <laughs> the rap music video and my of high school trauma they put your headmaster in your school of the whole school yeah they, they don't film music videos in the school anymore for that reason <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> well anyway would would the mm-mm at the end of the words also it's not like a real word i know but know. it's, it's like sound. the effects though mm-hmm. like the same yeah. because you get that of the a government by the people for the people whatever that it's it's giving you this whatever. rhythm i'm sorry abraham lincoln um it's giving you this this rhythm and that was something else i wanted to say about the song she uses the metaphor of dancing a lot Honey, and what no, repetition what repetition does is it gives you an actual beat like repetition gives you the best beat a you sick beat get. if you will a sick if beat. you will <laughs> uh, and i think that that's that's a fun effect too of like again these simple songs they, they can be simple that's fine i have no problem with people writing simple songs but like she's not just throwing a song together she is still right. there's a purpose to everything that she's doing here even if the words are simple like a lot of like again if we go back to all too well or if you even get into like her like evermore and folklore those are m- much more literary you have big words and phrases that might seem more ap this is much more simple like i don't know many more one syllable words in this song than maybe two syllable words that doesn't mean it's basic it doesn't and maybe we should rec- i shouldn't say basic we have to reclaim basic didn't we talk about that somewhere <laughs> um that doesn't mean there's not complexity here. There's not doesn't mean there's not purpose here. Like yeah. these words were chosen purposefully. I think people tend to gravitate towards looking at metaphors, like a beautiful mm-hmm. visual imagery. Some of the things right. that we've talked about on other episodes, sometimes as evidence of it being more complex and maybe a combination of more rhetorical devices. Here again, like there's not I mean, 
honestly, we're focusing on repetition. I feel like if we if we just went down the rhetorical list, we could find quite a few <sighs> devices used, even oh, yes. even yeah. within these lyrics. It's just we're not seeing a ton of that comparative imagery, maybe. I don't right. think this is the most metaphorical song. It's kind of at surface value. And that's I think I keep using the word surface because that's what comes to it's not like it doesn't feel like there's like 80 levels deep. And I think that is a choice with the I rhetorical devices that she uses. Like she's not necessarily going it's for it's not 80 levels deep. But That's, I think yeah. that, yeah. But, the, but there the are so- layers to analysis. There yes. are, yeah. There, and I think what the story is trying to tell you, if you would like to go there, is deep is like don't let the haters get to you but that's what i'm saying i think that's enjoy it on that surface level that's what i'm trying to say it's like the distinction is the way it's written it is very surface level it doesn't go into like many different levels deep which some songs do like you have specific rhetoric that is used to take people in to Deeper. certain emotions yeah yeah this isn't and, doing um, that but it is and still that's okay. yeah it's doing something else the purpose and is different i will let all if you know we are going to be deep diving the song so we will go deeper we, we will, will go say deep. more <laughs> um because there is a lot that i want to say and i literally have a post in front of me telling me what i'm saying in the next episode so i don't spoil it here but i will give you a preview which is that like i think that the reason this stays surface is because it it, it was intended to right this was yeah. her first introduction into pop music and and what so we'll talk and more I, about I the role it, of this song and the purpose and i think that's a really important distinction to make just as like a writing strategy because the whole purpose of these rhetorical devices is they are there to help you very effectively do what you're trying to do so right. depending on what the purpose is depending on what the writers trying to achieve you use different things at different times and i think one thing that we're seeing is like repetition is highly highly effective yeah. in doing certain kinds of things you might use other rhetorical devices for other kinds of purposes and that's kind i think of that's so interesting because if i think back to you know my high school self and ap english i don't ever think i really thought about the purpose of what yeah. i was trying to write the purpose was like to get an a right it was to right. like summarize yeah. what i needed to do and and just say what i need to say and move on but if you're writing a song or if you're writing you know because writing is something you want to do you often have a different purpose or a message that you're trying to convey and there are different things you can do to convey that message and you have to think about who is your audience who am i speaking to what am i trying to get them to feel in this moment and these rhetorical devices will help you convey that emotion exactly i think if you write really really frequently such as a songwriter that's responsible for writing hundreds of songs or a screenwriter that's trying to write Mm -hmm. in different voices um you need to pull these tools out of your toolbox for different things i think we talked about in a different episode of like if you're writing a horror story or a scary movie mm-hmm. or versus comedy versus romance, you pull on these different devices to do different kinds of things. Um, Abraham Lincoln's speech is going to obviously be very, very different from like a teacher trying to communicate with students. You're going to use different devices to have that effective communication. Although they both use repetition. It's true. I think that's what's so fun. Honestly, I think with this episode, we are doing what is considered more simple songs. But I feel like we, as a podcast, I feel like we're I'm we're we're going up a level. We're getting into sophomore here instead of freshman. Uh, do um, freshmen take AP English? I don't know, but you, whatever. Junior but, instead of sophomore. <laughs> but meta- when you do rhetorical analysis, metaphors are the easiest place to start because once you can grasp, hey, this metaphor could have been anything. They could have used any image in the world. It's pretty easy to start saying, well, what's the impact of this image? What's the impact of this image? But in the same way that everyone in the world uses metaphors for different purposes, that's actually true for so many of these devices. Repetition can do intensity right. like when in king lear when he says never 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 before he passes out that's heartbreaking here taylor's saying shake 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 and that's empowering that it's and then out the of repetition the woods, is a was, tool out of the woods saying out of the woods created a lot of anxiety we talked about that in our eco criticism yeah. episode so yeah i think that that's a really good point that like here shake 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 break break is like a pushing it's an empowerment it's a taking having agency and reclaiming you know, who you are and how you're feeling. Whereas out of the woods, the rep- repetition of out of the woods created this like anxiety and tension. And as an example of that, I actually want to bring it back to like something that I brought up earlier on this episode, which mm-hmm. is like the mm-mm at the end of the first few lines. Like mm-hmm. here's an example of a so- sound that is repeated at the end of the lines. And yes, it acted as a great filler in between these lines as she's doing it. 
But I feel I always interpreted that as like the people, the people who yes. are criticizing the haters that are hating. They're like the chorus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the great like, chorus. The great <laughs> chorus. It's like everybody like wagging a finger at her being like, Mm-mm. like, I don't know. It's just like it's like a head nodding kind of noise at love, like the people listening as yeah. they're like she's singing so that's such an that's an example of like a really simple like little sound that is sprinkled throughout this song to fill up space but also kind of serves multiple purposes yeah um i think a great example of like how intelligently this song is pieced together yeah and i i think the purpose kind of what you were saying is such a good thing to consider it's something i really I worked a lot when I was teaching when you when you do this kind of stuff it's it's so easy to say well I don't like this song or I don't think the song is doing anything and that's not um, a particularly sophisticated analysis which Um, for the record I don't like this song but yes okay you don't have to that's my unsophisticated brain talking and it's it was always an interesting time to be like okay well why not but I even remember we I had uh, a small group of students who I knew very well and so I pushed the limit with them that I don't always do with students and there was a particular politician we'll say who was universally not liked by this group of students in a school in downtown indianapolis put the pieces together and we did a rhetorical analysis on one of the speeches from this person and they immediately were like idiot so dumb hate this person and i was like i'm not asking you that i'm asking you who are they who are they talking to and what is their purpose? And as they started analyzing it, they were like, I disagree with their purpose. I think they're doing something wrong, but they're very effective at what they're what trying they're doing. to do. And I was like, yes. And in some ways that was scarier, but yes, to stop saying, frightening. but to stop just dismissing me, like, I don't like it wrong. That's just take a moment and say, okay, but you might not yeah. be the audience. Who is yeah. the yeah. audience? What is at, the purpose? At work, we started saying audience before content, like, I'm a marketer. And so it's like, who is your audience? Who are you trying to talk to? And that should inform what content you create for them and what you're trying to convey and, and how you put it together. And I think it's the same thing here. Like, who is the audience for this song? What do you, what do they need to hear? And how do you convey it? And here, I think it's the audiences. She, she wants to turn and move into pop. Great. They need yeah. to capture those pop listeners while not abandoning her fans, yeah. her existing fans. How do you do that? <clears throat> And we'll talk but it's more. also like women and you know we'll talk more yep. about it but yeah i was, I was like we'll talk more about this in the, we'll talk more about it in the deep dive but i also think like just like with the last song it's important technology highly effective right like stuck in everybody's yes. head on every radio overplayed to death uh not overplayed to death you can never play this song too much well, i love it i felt like it was overplayed to death but <laughs> but but because it was such a success and put her on the map in many many ways which For i sure. think it's definitely yeah. a whole other rabbit hole that will go down. Yeah. Whether liking something or not liking something is a different conversation than whether or not something is effective or ineffective. Right. I exactly. have read many books in my life and I'm like, this they is objectively like. not a well-written book, but I loved it. And I've read many books. So I'm like, this is a good written book. I did not enjoy my time right. writing it. And that's okay. Like that's those, okay. those are not the same thing. For sure. We need to, as a society, separate that out a little okay. bit more. So. <laughs> So we cool. will talk more about Shake It Off in next week ep- uh, next week's episode. Hello and welcome back. I am here with our last song of this episode. Uh, I actually also did a song off of 1980. I think there's a clear trend here, which is uh, some of the repetition is happening in these poppier songs. Uh, but the song that I chose to do was This Love. It was written by Taylor Swift. I love songs that are written just by Taylor Swift and nobody else's in the writing credits because I don't know I I think it sounds like those are my favorites and this one first came out in 2014 it's on 1989 it was re-released on 1989's Taylor's version in 20 the song that I chose is this love pause for dramatic effect I I do love this song it's really beautiful it is such a beautiful song I love this love this love is the title of the song. It's also a line that is repeated throughout this song. It's actually not where I started for when I chose the song. Um, I was looking for Epizusa specifically, and this song does have examples of that in the first uh, stanza, if you will, uh, in the first few lines. I could go on and on and on and on, and I will. And then she also says, and you were just gone and gone and gone and gone 
kind of like where I started. And then there's a ton of anaphora because almost the entire song starts, every line starts with the words, this love, this love is good, this love is bad, this love is alive, back from the dead. At the very end of the song, which I don't think it's as easy to see in the lyrics, although the lyrics do kind of have it like in parentheses because it's the background voices. But when you listen to it, you really feel like it's waves this washing love, yeah. over you, over you, yes. like again and again and again. It's what a pound that It's a ah! That's going to be really loud because I just like uh, threw my mic right into my face so I, I could say it. Um, I want a t-shirt that says, it's a palimpsest. It's a palimpsest. <laughs> Ask me about the palimpsest. <laughs> but it's just this love, oh. this love, this love, this love, this love, I can't love, wait till we can afford love, to license the music love. so it's not us singing it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like my singing on this show? Oh, it's, no. yeah, it's oh, beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it has a different emphasis and effect than maybe what Taylor had intended initially. Yeah. I get it. Um, anyways, she does repeat the word the, this love a million times at the end. It creates these waves, and I think that ties back beautifully to the first stanza verse yes. clear blue water high tide came and brought me in like and she that, does a sorry go ahead no just say she does like the um, the repetition just continues the imagery that she started at the very beginning yeah so I, Guys, actually... i'm also realizing oh. this could have been a great gatsby song because it's very much reminding me of the final line and so we beat on boats against the current born back ceaselessly into the past okay well everything yeah so we'll do we'll do a gatsby part two Pull this in. I never Every would have thought of that for this until until Monzi read the first opening lines and I was like, that sounds Damn really it. similar to the Great Gatsby final line, which is quite famous. Well, so I want to talk about the opening and the ending specifically. Great. Um, so Jody has done a marvelous job tying these two together. Maybe I'll take some credit for teeing that up. But I <laughs> do think that the the similarity there is those are the two parts where the epizuxis is used. And specifically, it starts with water, clear blue water. Wait, are you guys hearing a noise in my mind? Yeah. What is, is that? Is it you or is it? I don't know. It just came out of nowhere. It's, it stopped for me now. I, I, don't, was know like, what, I don't know what happened. But... My headphones, but okay. Okay, okay that's fine. So Let me repeat. Whatever you were saying, say it again. <laughs> yeah. So it starts with clear blue water. Whenever you have water immediately flowing taylor loves to use water imagery in different ways Clean but, is and then what i thought of exactly and then specifically she goes into high tide came and brought you in so you already have this setup right from the first two lines of like coming in and going out the use of the epizuxis here is on and on so i really do i like to me i got this sense of like the tide coming in and in and in and, and then going out 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 it shows that continuity again that we've seen in some of the other songs. It's not just that it came in and left. It like came in for a hot minute. It went out for a hot minute. <laughs> it's the emphasis of longevity or just like an extension. And then at the very end, the way that she said this love, this love, this love, this love over and over and over again. And the fact that this love came back to me, that's, I think, because it was teed up in the beginning, you feel that flow at the end also. So it feels like that ebbing and flowing water, both at the beginning and the end. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And then the middle piece is is where we have all these anaphoras. We have a lot of repetition, but it's a little different. But you just you close and open with this in and out. There are so many... You you kind of said this too, but even as I'm like listening to the song in my head and I can't sing, so I will not... Um, <laughs> she very much musically does it that way where she kind of builds up and then immediately like drops and kind of builds up and then immediately drops vocally and it has that tide going in and out of like going you know kind of the building up and then the pulling back she does that vocally and the background music as well but like I, hearing her voice she's doing that too and in the chorus itself this love is good this love is bad this love is alive back from the dead right it comes and goes yeah and she just continues that that feeling even in the middle there is one part where it's like but you were still gone 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 and it's actually a time where she references sinking ships so it's like losing grip sinking ships um and so there's really kind of this theme throughout of the love is kind of like water i've got a lot it, of songs that this reminds me of the first one is clean which is also on 1989 because of the water imagery she uses a lot of that there that chorus about a love it's good it's bad it's alive it's back from the dead we are never, ever getting back together, right? Bringing it back to the song we started today's episode with, that feeling of, you know, coming and going and coming and going. And then sinking ships. She talks about sinking ships in Gold Rush, gleaming, twinkling eyes like sinking ships on water so invited I almost jump in. 
there's my to me i i thought of uh the line where like if you love somebody you gotta let them go and you have to come back like it feels like one of these mm. songs that maybe yeah. was inspired by something like that where like you hear someone say something and you're like hmm, let me play with that i don't know if that's what happened here but it does remind me of that very famous phrase um, because she said these hands yeah. had to let it go free and this love came back to me. I think what's interesting too is, and this is in some ways, I think the difference of the effects of some of these, when you think about Epizuxis, you know, Shake It Off is just such a good example. It does, it creates that like almost a quick beat when it's one word, especially shake, 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 shake. shake but yeah. Anaphora creates more of a flow. This love is good. This love is bad. This love is alive back from the, the rhythm. dead. It's more of a, yeah, it's a, it's less of a, you know, kind of like staccato type of thing. But she even too, and this isn't repetition, but it's just, it still does the same effect. These are quite short lines compared to some of her other songs of, yeah. you know, Lantern Burning. That's one line, you know, and uh, what was the other one? Tossing Burning. Burning. Yeah, but, and then been losing grip on sinking ship. She does a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. not, it's not an internal rhyme, but rhyming on one line. So it's not necessarily, yeah. it's not an A, B, A, B pattern. A lot of it is on one line, which mm. again creates, it's not a staccato quick, like shake, 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 but it still is creating this like going in and out kind of pretty smoothly, but quickly as well. Yeah. It's a beautiful um, song that I don't think I gave enough song. credit. Yeah, I'm trying to find the rhetorical device that's for the parallel structure that's used because that's another device that does have a very specific name, uh, but I just don't have it handy right now. But yeah, it's a beautiful I song. It's It really is like conveying like this emotion. I, I think here's an example of where she has paired together a few different things. Like she's got this repetition, but it is kind of like a larger metaphor. That's why we're all coming back to this water and this ebbing flow. So she's actually managed to put in some comparative language with uh, some repetition here. And mm -hmm. the effect is different. It's like all of a sudden, you know that this feels or different, yeah. I think a lot of people would say it like immediately feels more complex. Um, it, not really. Like the words themselves are very simple. Yeah. I think, Jody, you mentioned like one syllable words. I think that is still very true here. I think this has really simple imagery. language. Yeah. But she's managed there's to like kind of take it up a notch on the complexity. And I think that also the difference to me, the first two songs that we talked about have a lot of like bringing like that's what people say or conversation and colloquialism. So in We Are Never Ending ever getting back together it's saying this is it i've had enough because like we haven't seen each other in a month like she's relaying what she and this person have said and then in shake it off she's relaying what people say i stay out too late i go on i got nothing on my brain so you've got more of like relaying what you're hearing from others or conversations you've had whereas in this love it is her telling how she's feeling and so it's much more internal versus external and the internal i feel like can be much more of a complex story not even comp she's creating more imagery here um because she's just trying to color and convey her emotions versus trying to relay what people are saying yeah i think the comparison to taylor two cities is i have to read that quite, book we talk about it all the time and i've never read it it's probably not my favorite dickens but it's it has one of my favorite <laughs> female dickens characters but she's also the villain but she's pretty cool I like um, villains. Villains are great. There's nothing wrong with a villain. She, uh, in this song, Taylor, so let me back up. So in the opening to A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And there's more stuff. But by and using anaphora, there's more stuff. it's very long. <laughs> it's like one of the longest sentences ever. But it does this thing where by repeating it is, it's saying best of times and worst of times. Two completely different things. But because it's repeating, it's saying this, this time is a multitude there's multiple things happening and and in a tale of two cities they're kind of talking about london and paris so it's like but at hmm. the same time on the same day of history there's the best of times happening and the worst of times happening and that's what the effect has and you get that here this love is good this love is bad that at the same time or you know this this same thing is a multitude it has multiple sort of contradictory things but it's complex and it, the effect gives you informs you of that very effectively um and that's the, one of the benefits of anaphora is when you're trying to kind of break down something complex if you just repeat it it's kind of like oh this same love is a lot of things it's glowing in the dark it you know came back to me it left a permanent mark you know like it's all of these things and it's all this love at the same time <laughs> 
I I, like um, I was able to find the word aphorism is another device that is uh, yes. the, the concise that you were talking about, Jen, of like, there's like words that are really phrases that are really concise and short to get the point across um, is a great example of aphorisms, which just kind of lists out the pr principle um, in very few words so that you get the, the point across your smile, it's my ghost. It's a um, big vocab day. It is. Big yeah. Well, day. I think it's nice to, we're focusing on uh, repetition, but it is nice to like go down the yeah. rhetorical devices every now like and then it. to tear these things apart because it's like, wow, there's a lot in here. There's a lot here. And I want to know, Taylor, did you intend this? Did you know this? I don't think you always have to know the terminology no. of what you're you know, using. You know the feeling that you want to but I think yeah. that's yeah. I think that's what makes a strong writer is that good writers do use a lot of these devices. And experts mm. over the years have put names to them and definitions mm -hmm. to what they're doing so that we can talk about it. But the writers just instinctively know to use a ton, a ton of devices the, to do what the they feeling that they want to create. Yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of like I said earlier too, like these are all tools. And so when we talk about the rhetorical triangle in our deep dives, that's why it's so important. I, as an author to whoever my audience is and whatever my purpose is, that is the outline, but then I get to take all of these tools and decide what one's going to help me, what's mm. going to help me accomplish my purpose. An activity I used to do in class was pretend you just got arrested and you're in jail. Write an email to your parents, your best friend, and to me asking for help. And they okay. instinctually write very different they're emails. They're not copying and pasting. And it's kind of a like gets them down this road of like you change how you right. communicate based on your audience. Who is your audience? But as soon as you get like into school, they go to the same. And I'm like, no, no, like, yeah. you got to still change this. You've got to understand who you are, what you're trying to do, who you're trying to convince, you know, all that stuff, which kind of full circle back to this song is this song has all this repetition. It is not as catchy as the other two we talked about. It's a great no. song. Slower. I will remember it, but it doesn't have that, yeah. you know, earworm not an earworm effect. definitely one thing though is i it's not it's definitely not meant to be like a radio hit it was definitely not be, meant to be like that single kind of a thing right. um i do think that sometimes when people talk about a really complex feeling like love there's so many different approaches in literature and in song to try to capture that and i think the songs that i was actually considering was this one or you this you can hear it in the silence. Hmm. You're, You're in, love. in love. You're, You're in, love. in love. Yeah. Um, both songs, I think, trying to c capture really, really complex feelings using is very that simple as words. Well? I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's like what Taylor? What were you doing on 1989? <laughs> but I loved your call out about using the simple words, like the one syllable yeah. words, because I think sometimes people feel like they need to use this really extravagant language to describe things that are complex. You don't. And she has done in both of these songs, she's captured a really like wide range of emotions in very simple language, but I think through the use of clever techniques and so although yeah. this is not really like the catchy kind of bop that will people have in their heads it it the repetition here is used in a really effective way to add that level of complexity and like communicate what such a com com complicated emotion mm -hmm. in very few words i want to say so much about 1989 and why so maybe <laughs> maybe maybe this is a good place to wrap that way we can Save that all for our deep I'm gonna dive. Say Jen wants to say something. Go ahead, Jen. One more thing. Okay, great. Well, this is just teacher Jen coming out. I think what, Monzi, what you said is like every person in the world communicates. Whether you're a writer or not, you're communicating. And it's so easy when your audience is someone who you either think is smarter than you, who for some reason you're, some, you're not super sure or you're intimidated by your audience. You t People tend to default to longer words or more complicated words. And this is teacher Jen telling you, use the word that communicates best what you're trying to say. And if it's a short word, great. 99% of the time, it will be a short word. I used to always show my students, there's the scene in Friends where Joey's writing a 
letter of recommendation for Monica and Chandler who are going through the adoption process, but he uses the th the thesaurus on like every <laughs> word because he wants it to sound smart. And like the whole, the punchline is his name's Joey Tribbiani and it's signed baby kangaroo Tribbiani. Like that's the punchline. <laughs> and it's hilarious, but it, it gets the message across because <laughs> if he just didn't do that, it's a, it was a sincere, it was a really sweet, sincere letter that he destroyed by trying to make it quote unquote smarter. So this is just teacher Jen's advice. Don't do that. Use simple words. Get your message across clearly. That is more effective than trying to sound quote unquote smarter. Smart. Because guess what? People are not as smart as you think they are almost all the time. So we can wrap on that. But I had to say that. I love it. No, I thank you for saying that. That definitely needed to be said. Oh, this is a great episode. Thank you for my long list of um, rhetorical device. <laughs> words that I now need to go add to my vocabulary. Uh, that's it. That's all we have for you today. Join us next week as we do a deep dive into my favorite song, Shake It Off. <laughs>